after that worship, man, my adrenaline is pumping. Oh, my goodness. Was that not incredible? Whoa. Wow. I'm like, I'm feeling the pressure. I'm like, man, I got to bring it. I got to bring a good one today after that. It's good. Hey, today we're talking about uh, our series, week two of I'm a Bringer. And the title of the message today is Aw Sheep. Okay? Aw Sheep. But if you take yourself a little serious, too serious, you can call it reaping a spiritual harvest for Christ. Okay, you can just mark that out on your notes and just put that in there, and uh, you can call, call it something else. Today we're talking about uh, reaching, reaching friends for Christ. We're talking about uh, bringing people to the house of God. Next Sunday, of course, will be our fall kickoff, just as we saw in the video. And uh, we're going to just pack this place out. It's going to be one of the most incredible weekends here at Edge Church that we have ever had before. And we're starting this new series, Half Asterisk, which I'm so pumped about. We're talking about overcoming mediocrity in our lives. You know, everywhere we turn, we are tempted to live a mediocre life. And so we're going to be talking about that over the next three weeks. It's going to be fantastic. A great, great weekend to bring friends. And so last week, we kind of kicked this off. Today we want to continue this. We're bringing friends to the house because we have the greatest message of all, which is the message of Jesus Christ, the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. And so we just have an amazing opportunity uh, to share his love and compassion with others. And so I want to challenge you this week uh, to just be thinking about the people that you're going to bring and who are going to sit beside you next week. Many of you have already been telling me about the people you're inviting, the people you're bringing, the people you're praying for. And I've just, I want you to know I am so proud of you guys as your pastor because you've been out thinking and praying and inviting and doing all the work that we talked about last week. And I'm telling you, God does something great when we focus our attention on his work in reaching people. Our, our scripture this morning is found in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And I want us just to stand together as we read God's word in Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. So let's just stand today as we read the word of God. The Bible says, Then Jesus went to all of the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to the disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Lord, we thank you today for your word that has been given to us and to help us to receive your word with an open heart and an open mind because you are truly a great God. We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. You can grab a seat. And uh, Jesus is teaching his disciples in Matthew chapter 9 about, about the harvest. It's about it's about reaching people. And he says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so I want to take a few brief moments this morning to challenge us to think about reaching people with the good news of Jesus. Reaching people with the good news of Jesus. That's really our theme this morning. And the Bible tells us, first of all, that reaching people should be motivated by compassion. Motivated by compassion. You see Jesus uh, the scripture says in verse 36, felt compassion for them when he saw the crowds because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus was a people magnet. Everywhere people went, people wanted to be with Jesus. Have you ever wondered why was Jesus such a powerful personality? Why was it that people loved Jesus? I know he was the son of God, but what was it about him that made people want to follow him around and, and, and to listen to his teaching and to spend time with Jesus? Now, you could say it was his miracles because, listen, nobody did the miracles that Jesus did. Jesus did some profound things. You, you could say maybe it was his teaching because Jesus taught some of the most profound things in, in all of human history. But, but could I also say this? One of the most magnetic things about Jesus was his compassion. 
Jesus loved people. Jesus was concerned for the needs of people. And you notice in the passage it says that he healed every person. Jesus was doing everything that he could possibly do. I mean, he was healing people. He was teaching people. He was preaching because he was compassionate. And that heart of compassion was at the root of the ministry of Jesus. Everywhere you see Jesus, you see his compassion for people. And that's why people loved him so much. That's why people, that's why people still love Jesus, because of that compassion that he has. And Jesus just has the ability to see really behind the scenes in our lives. Jesus has the ability to kind of pull the curtain back and see the stuff that nobody else sees. We all have kind of a facade you know, that we wear, the clothes that we wear, the car we drive, the job we have, the house we live in. But Jesus sees behind the facade, he sees the heart, the heart of every person. He sees the pain. He sees the struggle. Oh, he sees the adversity. He sees the hardship. He knows everything you're going through today. And you know what? He knows the pain of every friend and every family member that you have. That's why we love to connect people, to make that connection with people to Jesus because Jesus is the most compassionate person that ever lived. He is. But reaching people begins with a like-minded heart. If Jesus is, has a compassion for people, we ought to be compassionate towards people too. And I have found in my own life that when I began to look behind the scenes in people's lives, that I become less judgmental and more compassionate. Have you ever wondered, why does she do that? Or why does he do this over there? A lot of times it's because there's things in our past or in our history or you know, in the family that we grew up in, or circumstances we've been through, or adversities that we've been through. And, and sometimes we make choices out of our own pain and struggle. But listen, Jesus sees all of that. He sees every bit of it. The Pharisees, the religious establishment, they just saw the people. But Jesus saw the individuals. And he was moved with compassion for them. Jesus is out encouraging and teaching and healing. He's doing everything he can to direct these people. And you notice it says they were like sheep without a shepherd. Um, they were confused all over the place. And compassion is really love and action. We've, we've, we've seen in the last few weeks um, with, the, with the death of Robin Williams that um, Robin Williams had everything together kind of on the outside. People loved the guy. He was funny, he had a great career, he, he was very successful, he was a philanthropist, you know, he entertained the troops. I mean, people loved that guy, that guy had a lot of friends. And yet, there was something, there was something in his heart, addictions and depression and other stuff, that you didn't see, you didn't see that on the outside, because that was on the inside. And, and can I submit to you today, that Jesus sees everything in our hearts. Jesus sees the stuff that nobody else sees. And when he sees that, he doesn't respond with a heart that is judging, but one that is really of one of compassion. And that's why people loved him. That's why he was such a, a magnet to people, is because of his compassion. And we're called to emulate that. And, you know, in our, in our offices, when coworkers are sick or in the hospital, we need to be the first people to follow up to show love and compassion, to visit people in the hospital. We need to be the most encouraging people on the planet because we should be so compassionate. And when we do so, we are really living out the life of Christ that God wants us to have. Uh, they say that sheep are the dumbest animals in the world. I don't have a lot of experience with farm animals. Some of you do. Some of the farm people are here today. But sheep are dumb. Now, I know some of you hate cats. You've told me. Do we have any cat haters in here? All right. Cats are far, far more intelligent than sheep. They really are. A sheep can be just down the street from where he lives, and he'll get lost. Sheep are high maintenance. Some of the guys in the house thought, my wife is high maintenance. You ain't seen nothing. The sheep, they got to be led. The shepherd has got to be directing and mending wounds and protecting. And I mean, if, if, this, if the shepherd's not there, the sheep scatter. 
They, they, they go crazy. They'll be eaten by wolves. They have no defense mechanisms. They don't know what to do. They are the most innocent of, of animals. And that's why the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, we're all like sheep. We've gone astray. That's why we need a savior. That's why we need Christ because we all have that propensity to kind of do our own thing and kind of wander off over here and over here and over here. But Jesus saw this in verse 36. It says he, he saw that the sheep were hurting and when he told, uh, told them, he, he saw that they were weary. Uh, in other words, uh, in the language of the New Testament, this word weary means to fillet or to skin. It means to be troubled or battered or beat up. It means to, 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 to endure tremendous pain. So Jesus saw the pain. He saw the weariness. He saw the tiredness. Sometimes you just get tired in your life. You just get worn down. Jesus saw all of that and he responded in compassion. And that's why we're in the business of bringing people to Christ Inviting people to the house of God to hear the life-changing message of Christ because he is so compassionate. He really is. And I love this part about Jesus. I really do. I love this. Uh, so we should be motivated by compassion. Here's the second thing. We should be driven by prayer. Okay, prayer should be a huge part of us influencing and reaching our family and our friends for Christ. We need to be praying. And notice the, what Jesus said about prayer in verse 37 and 38. And he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest. Now, in the English Standard Version, it says pray earnestly. We ought to be praying earnestly for people. And uh, more specifically, though, it's interesting, Jesus doesn't say, Pray for the sheep, he says, pray for the shepherds. Now notice this, he says, pray for the workers. Pray that God would put workers into the field for the harvest. Now why is Jesus talking about praying for the workers instead of the lost sheep? Because everything rises and falls on leadership. If you have a great company, many times it's because there's great leadership that's there. If you have a great church... A growing church, there's good leadership that's there. If you have a family that raises godly kids, there's, there's good leadership that's there. Jesus is saying if the leaders are there, the sheep will follow. If we have the shepherds in the field, the sheep will come along. So we ought to pray for the shepherds. We ought to pray for the leaders. And by the way, I don't think this just means pastors. I think, I think some of us in this room... Uh, have too small of a vision for our own lives. We think, well, I'll let other people be the shepherd. A shepherd is a person that starts to influence people. Wherever you are, whatever you're involved in, you can influence people. Just start with the people right around you. Who can you influence? Who can you encourage? Who can you bless? Who can you talk about the Lord with? Who can you pray for? Just start leading. Just start leading and the sheep will start to follow. We need to pray for God to put more shepherds and more leaders into the field so that the harvest can be brought in. We need more leaders. We ought to pray for more churches to be started. Many of you know that Gina and I started this church just a few years ago. We had five people in our living room uh, that very first Sunday that we had. I was pretty discouraged by that, five people. Not a lot of folks, not a lot of sheep that were there. But you know what? God continued to bless it. It continued to grow. And uh, when I first began to think about um, this concept of the harvest and the workers, I was in Siberia. Anybody here ever been to Siberia? Okay, no one. Okay, yeah. I didn't think anybody had been to Siberia. It's, it's probably not a place most of us are going to visit. I went on a mission trip there as a college student. It was right after the fall of communism. And uh, there was a great spiritual openness in the Russian people after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I'm over there with a couple of my friends. I've got a couple of translators. We're knocking on doors, and I'm telling you, the receptivity of people to the good news of Jesus was off the chain. People are committing their lives to Christ. I mean, it was unbelievable. And just, you know, flat after flat after flat, all the buildings look the exact same. You, you, you get confused on even where you are. But there was such great receptivity, and I thought, you know, if I could just do this seven days a week, 12 hours a day, I would never run out of people that want to hear about Jesus. 
It was incredible to think about. And they would invite us into the apartment, you know, and I'd be there with my translator. And I had my whole little spiel. My name is Ryan. I'm from America, you know. And, of course, in Siberia, they're like, who is this guy? You know, it's Ryan from America. Come on in. They would offer us some chai. And if they really loved the message of Jesus, they would offer us some Russian vodka. Yeah. That's how you knew the spirit was really working, you know. I'm like, I got too many people to talk to about Jesus. I can't drink any vodka with you, but thank you so much for the offer. I really do appreciate that. It means a lot. There is more people that want to hear about Jesus. The, the demand is greater than the supply is what Jesus is, is saying here. And uh, even in America today, I know you may think, well, Ryan, that's in Russia. You know, and I don't know what's going on in Siberia. I haven't been back. I've only been one time, but... but I have found people in Colorado want to hear about Jesus. Jesus is a magnet. You're here today because you want to hear about Jesus. People love Jesus. Is everybody going to be a follower of Christ? No. But you know what? A lot of people are. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. And so we ought to pray more diligently for God to put workers into the harvest field. And by the way, when I begin to pray about things, sometimes God says, Ryan, you might be the answer. (laughs) So you may be praying, God put workers in the field. Oh, well, okay, yeah, God, I get it. I, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm supposed to get busy. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm the answer to, to part of my prayer. We need to be about the work of the kingdom, the work of God. And our vision is too small. Our vision is too small. Sometimes as Christians, we think that, that our impact of our life could just be maybe like one or two people. And we'll think, man, if I could just connect one or two people to Jesus, then, oh my goodness, you know, like my life would be amazing. And you know what? That's a great start. But God may want to do a lot more in your life than just that. And you may be settling for so much less than what God wants to do. We have a big vision here at Edge Church because we have a great God and there is a great harvest that is to be brought in. And that's why we need to be adding worship services and adding campuses and we need to be expanding the reach of the Edge Church because the harvest is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful. We just need more workers to get into the field, Jesus says. It's kind of like the demand is greater than the supply and we learn this in economics, you know, and, and some of you are in business. We're seeing this in real estate right now. The the housing prices are up. If you're trying to sell a house, this is a great market to sell a house. The bad thing is you got to go buy a house too, so it may not be as good for you. But people are getting full full price uh, offers on their homes like in three days, a week, the thing's gone. And, and there's more people that want a house than there are houses to buy. So the price goes up. Now the opposite is true too. If the demand goes down and the supply is too high, then prices go down. But right now, the demand is great, and it's very competitive. A lot of people want to buy a house. Jesus said the demand is greater than the supply. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So what do we need? We need more workers in the field. We need more people serving here at the church. We need, we need more people bringing friends uh, to worship. Because the demand is greater than the supply. And the potential is unlimited. I just imagine that maybe Jesus was out there on a countryside looking out into the fields around harvest time and pointing maybe to the disciples and showing them the harvest is plentiful. Do you see over here? Do you see over here? As far as the eye could see, there was, there was harvest, harvest, harvest. But where are the people going to come from? Because listen, if you're going to harvest a crop, That is not something you do by yourself, especially in the ancient world. That is a team sport. It takes everybody, everybody in the field to accomplish the work. So we ought to be praying, praying for God to put leaders in the field of the harvest. But here's the third thing. We also need to remember that reaching people is accomplished by diligence, by work. Now we don't work to earn the favor of God. God gives us His favor by His grace. So you can't do anything to make God love you more than He already does. But listen, when God's love takes root in your life, you want to serve Him. You want to honor Him. That's why Paul said to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. It's hard work. Get into the field. Get your hands dirty. You may get cut up a little bit being out there in the harvest field. 
The workers are few. Look at verse 38 again. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. And there are many hands that are needed. Now, in the harvest, it takes a lot of people, and there's a great celebration. Isaiah chapter 9 tells us that after the harvest, there's a great party. Last week, we talked about the party, inviting friends to the party. But listen, in the ancient world, people celebrated the harvest. Why? Because there was food, and that was a good thing. People got excited when there was food. So there was a party, and I want you to know, when there's a harvest here at Edge Church, there is a party, there's a celebration. We get excited about that. That's something to be pumped up about. You know, we're motivated, we're encouraged. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, so we need to get into the field of the harvest, and that's why uh, Paul said in Romans chapter 10, how can somebody hear if somebody's not preaching to them? Interestingly enough, that was the scripture, it's Romans 10, 13 to 15, that was the scripture that God put on my heart to confirm my calling to move to Colorado to start Edge Church. I was reading in the Bible, the book of Romans, and that verse just jumped off the page, hit me square between the eyes, and I knew this is what God wanted me to do but listen a preacher is not just somebody who's ordained a preacher is somebody who just brings the word of God and sometimes we think people are going to come to faith in Christ by you know osmosis or something like that sometimes God needs us to speak up a little bit you know we have a lot of different methods when we think about talking about the Lord some people use the mime approach do you know what that is I will I will do good deeds I will mime it out you know I'm not going to say anything but I'm going to act it out. So I'm going to buy Girl Scout cookies from the next door neighbor. I'm going to keep my yard mode. I'm not going to speed. I'm going to pay my taxes. And you know what? When people see my lifestyle, they're going to see Jesus. And really what happens when we're miming it out, people are like, no, they're just nice people. Some people use the pressure soaker approach. It's like all in, heavy debates. I'm going to convert you in this instant. And if you're not on your knees praying in five minutes, you know, I'm going to attack you kind of thing. Pressure soaker approach. I'm going to baptize you right here on the spot. There's also the Ivy League approach. That's where you debate, talk about philosophies and things like that. You, you use words you don't even know what they mean. <laughs> you drink tea with your pinky out. The Ivy League approach philosophize it really goes nowhere though I think God is looking for people who are not necessarily scholars God's really looking for people to get into the fields of harvest that are, are not Ivy League educated but they're more people that are like from ITT Tech if you know what I'm saying the DeVry Institute of Technology hands-on training right let's keep it simple let's get to the point Let's, let's get into the field. Let's not overthink this and make this more complicated than it, than it is. The, 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 there's a practical, a practical implication. God's looking for that. And so we need to be posting on our Facebook pages. We need to be putting on Instagram. Come to Edge Church next weekend so we can share the life-changing message of Christ. You know, last week in this service, uh, I think 10 people committed their lives to Christ. It was maybe more than that. Isn't that great? <clears throat> I couldn't count all the hands. They were all up over, all over the place. I don't know how many there were. There were at least 10. There may have been more. What a great opportunity. This week I had an opportunity to invite a family to church, and I was talking to a 10-year-old boy and a mom, and the 10-year-old boy did not even know what a pastor was. And I thought, what a great opportunity to invite somebody to church that really needs to be here. Now, the mom was a little, I think, a little embarrassed you know, by that, and she should have been, but I think she, she was, but I, would, I just saw it as opportunity. I was like, well, thank God, you know, our paths crossed, and I don't even know you guys, but let me just extend the invitation. You know, why don't you guys come? Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? And uh, there's people like that all around us, all around us, man, and we have just what great opportunity. kind of reminds me of um, the fact that we play on a winning team, and uh, God's team is a winning team. Jesus is the star player. He really is. When I was in the fifth grade, I played, played on a football team, and we lost every single game. <laughs> every game. You know what? We didn't even score a touchdown in the entire season. Now, is that demoralizing? 
I remember walking out onto the field for the coin toss at the first game, and I looked up, and there was like three or four players from the opposing team, and they were the size of my dad. I was like, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? I was just hoping to reach puberty sometime soon. These guys are monsters. <laughs> Huge. And our team was just getting beat, 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 beat. I, I played wing back. I don't know if they even have wing backs anymore. I played wing back. But, but when the quarterback got hurt, uh, which was often, um, <clears throat> I played second string quarterback. I was the backup quarterback and the first string wing back. So our quarterback cried a lot. And so they would put me in when the quarterback cried. Well, the reason he cried is because the line didn't block it. He was always getting sacked and he was getting beat up. So then I'd get in there and get beat up afterwards. One time our coach was so frustrated, he called timeout and he called the team over and he, we were getting pushed back like every play that seemed like five or ten yards lost. You know, we were fumbling the snap and, you know, I don't know what was happening. It was just it was just bad. It was really bad. And the coach looked at me and he said, Ryan, I want you to get the ball and I just want you to punt it. I said, coach, it's third down. He said, I don't care. Just get rid of the ball. He was tired of losing yards, you know. Just get rid of it. So we punted on third down. Now, in the sixth grade, we came back and we actually won one game. We won six to nothing and we scored one touchdown for the season. So we were really proud of that. Like, things are getting better around here, baby. Come on. <laughs> you know, it's hard to get motivated when you play on a losing team, isn't it? You keep practicing. You keep trying. You, you keep trying to be positive. But you're getting, you're getting whooped. I mean, it's not good. Thank God we don't play on a losing team. The harvest is plentiful. We play on a winning team. And Jesus is the star player. What more do we need? What more do we want? We play on the winning team, and that's God's team. The harvest is plentiful. We just need more people in the field to do the work. At the early service, we had a lady that was here. Her name is Chandra. She said I could tell you her story. She uh, grew up going to church. Her parents were Christians. And uh, about 16 years ago, she started dating a guy who was an atheist. And she decided to kind of go into the, the thought and I guess the religion of atheism or lack thereof. She became an atheist. For 16 years, she's an atheist. She hates God. God doesn't exist, all that. 16 years. Well, they broke up last fall. And you know what happened? Her sister invited her to Edge Church. About the time we moved into this building, she started coming. She started sitting kind of over here on the side, kind of checking out, started coming to the girlfriends, started coming to church on Sunday. And you know what? One Sunday in January, at January, God spoke to her heart in a powerful way, and she committed her life to Christ and left the beliefs of atheism to follow Jesus. Is that not cool or what? Yeah. Great. She said, I could share her story with you. And the reason I wanted to share that story with you is because it's a great reminder that the harvest is plentiful. We just need to be about doing God's work, packing this place out, sharing the life-changing message of Jesus because Jesus is the most magnetic person who ever lived. He really is. We're motivated by compassion. We're driven by prayer. And God's work is accomplished by by diligence and by, by hard work.